I just wanted to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Henry Huntingdon. Um, he owns his own consulting company and is the Arctic Science Director for the Ocean Conservancy. Um, Henry's research activities include reviewing the regulation of subsistence hunting in northern Alaska, documenting traditional ecological knowledge of marine mammals, examining Inupiaq Eskimo and Inuit knowledge and use of sea ice, and assessing the impacts of climate change on Arctic communities and Arctic marine mammals. And Henry, I'll hand it over to you, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Colleen, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, let me just get this straight here, sharing the screen. That should be up and... Okay, is that a full, uh, full screen view of my slides? Yes. Okay, good. Well, thank you for the chance to, uh, to give the presentation this morning. I realize with a, with a diverse audience and uh, a variety of interests, I, I probably won't touch everything. And I suspect some of this will be old news to many of you, but I hope that there's at least something new in here for everyone. Um, what I'll talk about are the, an overview of sea ice use by coastal communities, um, primarily in Alaska. Um, as you probably know, sea ice is a, a platform that people use for hunting and for travel. It is, as, as uh, a couple of people had mentioned, uh, also a, a, a barrier or buffer that helps protect coastlines and do other things for, for uh, related to erosion and, and other topics, but that's a little outside of my expertise and I won't be, won't be touching on that very much today. But instead I'll be talking about the, how people use the sea ice and how that's been changing lately and then what some of those consequences are for, for people and communities along the coast. In Utkiagvik, formerly known as Barrow on the north coast, um, it's a, that's a prominent whaling community and spring whaling has been a, a huge feature of life there for, for millennia. And uh, they also whale in the fall, but the spring hunt has, has often been regarded as sort of the, the the more traditional one, you're out on the ice, people are camping out on the ice or used to be camping out on the ice for several weeks at a time, um, waiting for the whales to come by, going out in the, the seal skin boats to, to catch the whales. And then as you see in this picture, hauling the whales back up onto the ice to be, to be butchered. Um, in the past oh, 10 or 20 years or so, there've been enough changes in sea ice that hauling a a very large whale up on the ice has become problematic. I don't remember the length of this one in the photo, but I want to say in the 40 foot range, um, they do catch them that are up above 50 feet. Uh, one estimate is a ton a foot. So that's a 50 ton whale. I think for when you get over 50 feet, it may be closer to two tons a foot. Anyway, a whole lot of whale hauling up on the ice. In the old days when the ice was six feet thick, that was not a problem. When the ice is thinner, that gets to be a problem. You go to all the effort to haul a, a whale up on the ice using block and tackle and having a bunch of people pulling on the rope. And then the whale starts to crack through the ice and you're back where you started. Um, with a whale, you have about, well, 24 hours at the most before, thanks to the insulation of blubber, it, it starts to cook itself from the inside and render the meat unusable. So there is an element of haste to get the, the whale up so you can start butchering and make sure that everything stays fresh. Um, so it's a, that's a non-trivial uh, matter to find a good place to, to haul the whales up. In more recent years, um, the concern has gotten even greater about just the safety of being out on the ice. Uh, at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll show a couple of references, but I've posted those on the, along with the talk on the website. And one of them was a paper by, led by Craig George uh, from 2004, looking at some of the catastrophic failure, the failures of sea ice when the ice breaks up and, and drifts off and uh, can carry whalers out to sea. Um, now that, that has always been a concern. There's an even more of a concern lately that the ice is just unstable and, and unreliable. And when I was in Utkiagvik a couple months ago, people were talking about how unsure they were about sending their kids out on the ice and what, what that would mean. There have also been a number of changes in the way that whaling is practiced. Instead of being camping out on the sea ice and on the ice edge and waiting, um, there's been a tendency towards using and waiting and using the skin boats. There's been a tendency to using uh, aluminum skiffs and other boats. And the, the whaling season is now partitioned uh, early on skin boats in one area and the aluminum boats further north. 
Um, and then later in the season, it's aluminum boats everywhere. And there's some talk about how long they'll, they'll continue to have that uh, space and time carved out for the, for the skin boats. So spring whaling is becoming a, you know, more of a, a problematic matter in, in Utkiagvik when it never was something that people had to worry about. If we move a little to the southwest to Kotzebue, uh, seal hunting is a big deal there. This is a photo taken last November. November is not a time when you should be out boating around and hunting seals from a boat. In, in the old days, it would have, ice would have, been, uh, would have formed, the caribou would migrate south and come across the ice near caribou, near, uh, near Kotzebue. Uh, people could go out and hunt the caribou, you could go out on the ice to hunt seals and so on. Um, now the, the shore fast ice is forming later. As a, she's seen in this picture, by mid-November, people are still out in, in boats traveling around and hunting seals. And this is a very strange state of affairs for many people, but at least you can still go seal hunting. People were being very productive hunting seals in front of town, so they're getting what they need. There too, it's interesting to talk to some of the hunters about their experiences and the fact that there are very few hunters who are willing to go out on the, on the shore fast ice now and go seal hunting. It used to be people could travel tens or dozens of miles or more out on the sea ice to go polar bear hunting, to go seal hunting and so on. Uh, no longer, and many even experienced hunters are not willing to do that anymore. Um, you know, they've had some close calls, some bad experiences, or just unsure of the, of the reliability of the ice, and so are changing their habits as a consequence. A big factor in this is, is knowledge. In this picture, Warren Matumiak, a late elder from Utkiagvik, is looking at a sea ice imagery of, or Im satellite imagery of sea ice around the, the community and Andy Mahoney, the sea ice physicist, is, sea ice scientist is examining that with him. Um, the ability to know, to know what you're looking at is crucial. There was an interesting paper by James Ford and colleagues in Nature Climate Change last year examining uh, changes in weather and snow and ice conditions and its effect on the number of travel days that were available to people throughout the year. They found that there were some modest changes that, not surprisingly, less ice means fewer days traveling on ice, um, somewhat offset by more days of open water, meaning more days of traveling by boat. But to me, the really interesting feature of their work was the finding that an experienced hunter, you know, a highly, a highly skilled individual, uh, probably had in the neighborhood of 20 or 30 more days of travel available than an, a person of average skill. Just that extra skill, the ability to read the ice, to, to travel in marginal conditions and so on was a huge factor in how many travel days were available. And so that level of, of knowledge is really important in figuring out how you can deal with both with the changing conditions and to make the most of the conditions that are available. And it's important here to point out that knowledge is not perfect. Uh, Warren's own grandfather had at some point as well had when Warren was a child, his grandfather had gone out seal hunting one day and never returned. And we can assume that, you know, someone in the early part of the 20th century who's out seal hunting a lot is pretty skilled and knows what they're looking for. Knowledge can reduce risk. It can't eliminate it entirely. And that level of risk has always been a feature of, of Arctic society and always something that is not far from, from people's minds as they go about their activities. The effects of changing shore fast ice are, come in many forms. Um, the village of Kivalina, just to the northwest of Kotzebue, has not taken a bowhead whale since the mid 90s, in large part because the shore fast ice is just not reliable enough as a platform for going out whaling. Um, if we look at St. Lawrence Island in the Northern Bering Sea, work by Hayo Eiken and others has found that there used to be a period in the middle of winter when boating was just not possible. Um, Nowadays, there are undoubtedly days in which the ice is, the winds push the ice against shore and you can't get out, but there's no day of the year in which boating is, is not at least a, a possibility. Um, you know, depending on the conditions, any, any day of the year, the conditions might align and people can go out hunting by boat. So in some ways, maybe that creates a, a new or additional opportunities. On the other hand, remember that we are talking about the Northern Bering Sea in January. Um, what I've heard from communities all up and down the coast is that the, the ideal conditions for hunting in the spring, which you see in this photo, the, the ice is broken up, but it's still around. You can go boating, you can hunt seals. Uh, that period is much shorter. The shore fast ice is there, it breaks up. 
And instead of having a matter of several weeks in which you have conditions like that shown in the photo, you may have a matter of a day or two before the ice just goes away. And now either you have to pounce on that period and hope to get the seals you want. And we spoke to people in Utkiagvik who were not able to get the number of bearded seals they wanted to make the skin boat covers. Um, the alternative is to start hunting in open water with no ice. And that's something you can do, it is feasible. But if you take a bearded seal, it's pretty big and it's hard to haul it into a boat just by itself. Um, plus as one hunter we talked to said he'd been scolded by his mom for coming back with a, a whole seal rather than having gutted it out on the ice where, where it, uh, that should have been done. Of course, he had a good reason that there wasn't any ice to do that on, but I don't think his mom was overly sympathetic. Finally, um, the question is about the next generations. I unfortunately didn't have a picture of some of the local kids, but this is myself and my boys out on the ice near Utkiagvik some years ago. Um, as I mentioned, there's a question of knowledge and a question of risks. There's some concern that not all of the details of knowledge are being passed on to younger generations. Um, some of that is true, although some of the, the younger active hunters are out there and continually adding to the, the collective supply of knowledge and adding new information about the changing conditions and so on. But there's also a question of what's an acceptable risk. A friend in Kotzebue has said very, very powerfully that she is the last in her line to hunt whales on the ice because she won't let her kids do it. The risk is too high. Now, some of that risk may be higher than it was when she was a kid or when her parents were, were learning. Uh, some of it may just be a, a matter of changing our perceptions about what's acceptable when it comes to risk. Nobody wants to repeat what happened to Warren Matumiak's grandfather, um, you know, but the only way to make sure that never happens is not to go out on the ice. So I'd wrap up by saying that the social context is really important for understanding how people are addressing the, the changes and also what the changes mean for, for individuals and for communities. In talking with hunters recently in both Kotzebue and Utkiagvik, they had said, well, they can adjust. They're, this is what they do. They're good at adjusting. They're good at dealing with changing conditions. They will get the seals that they need. Okay, that's a, that's a nice optimistic view of the future. But what does that mean for the whole community? Remember the hunters, we were, the experienced hunters are those high skill hunters who have that extra 20 or 30 days of, of travel time available to them. That's not the case for the, you know, the average person in the community and it's not the case for the community as a whole. And so trying to understand those different impacts, that, the different ways that sea ice will affect you know, the, the elite hunters or the, the highly productive ones and what it means for the entire community is something that I think is important to do. As I mentioned, uh, you know, here are some, some papers. You don't need to take these down. You can just go to where I posted the talk on the website and, and these, these three papers are all posted there as well. So thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you, Henry. That was a really nice overview of what's going on in, in Alaska. And I just wanted to open up. We have a couple of minutes for any questions specific to what Henry talked about. Does anybody have any? So Henry, I actually had a question for you. So you gave a nice um, kind of overview on some of the um, changes that people are making in terms of trying to decrease risk, at least, um, in terms of the changing shore fast ice. But I, I'm assuming there, there have got to be some pretty drastic economic changes going on as well with these changes. And I'm wondering um, if you could talk more about, you know, I'm assuming they're having to spend more money on gas and other types of food if they're not able to catch whales and seals and things like that. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that. Sure, and that's a really good question of how, we, how people substitute for the opportunities that are missed. Um, if we look at, at Utkiagvik, uh, not so much a shore fast ice problem, but it, it comes into it. The spring whaling is now uh, you know, a little more difficult, a little riskier and so on. Utkiagvik is fortunate that they also have fall whaling. Fall whaling has for many years been a very productive season. People have gotten lots of whales and you know, that's been a, a good thing for the community, except for 2019 when they saw some whales in early September they decided that the whaling season wouldn't start until later in September. And between late September and mid-November, uh, people were out spending, I don't know how many hundreds of people hours out on the, out on the water and how many hundreds of gallons of, and thousands of dollars worth of gasoline searching back and forth and seeing not a single bowhead whale 
until November, and they finally got one in, in at some point in November. Um, and that's a huge consequence. Well, people said, sure, you can get caribou, you can get fish, there are other things around, but making those substitutions and making the decision that, gee, should we, should we bail on the whaling and go inland to get caribou because at least that's a little more certain. I mean, those are tough calls for people to make. Or do you keep looking, you know, and at what point after day after day after day of searching, do you decide that, gee, it's just not worth throwing more, you know, good money after bad at this point? That'll be a tough call. It'll be interesting to see what happens if, you know, I mean, we all hope that 2019 was just a really weird year for some reason, but we don't know. Yeah. Thank you. Um, any other questions for Henry at all? Yeah, Henry, this is Amy Holman. Good to see you uh, two days in a row. Um, <laughs> exactly. Hope you had a good tour of Anchorage. Hey, um, so uh, could you talk a little bit more about, you know, being up with the communities and what you're hearing they're interested in learning more about? You were talking about adaptation, but are there any particular questions that might be useful for this group? Well, it, that's a a really interesting question, Amy. I have uh, one of the NNA navigating the new Arctic uh, projects funded by NSF, and we're looking at uh, the question of, to put it bluntly, is sea ice the big, or is is climate change really a big deal? And that may sound like a silly question. Of course, it's a big deal, but if we put it in the context of what's going on in communities, is it the biggest deal? And that's right. one of the other papers that I posted where we we make the argument that. Yeah, it's a big deal, and there's a whole lot of other stuff going on that you need to pay attention to. And interestingly, when on on this particular NNA project, when we were in Kotzebue, um, as I mentioned, the the experienced hunters we talked to said, "Yeah, hey, we deal with this kind of stuff. You know, if you want to give me a better map of sea ice, sure, I'll take it. I mean, I'm happy to. I'll take any any useful tool I can get. But you know, that wasn't their their primary concern. The more concerns to, to put it. I mean, crudely, the, or to use a, a broad term, the question that seemed to be on people's minds was that of identity. If you know who you are as, as an Inupiaq, if you're raised in the traditional ways and so on, you've been taught and you've learned the skills of adjusting and adapting and dealing with uncertainty and dealing with, with variability and just persisting. Um, if, as is unfortunately the case for a lot of people, you've kind of lost lost that connection with your own culture, you haven't been, been raised that way, if there are other things that are mattering in your life, you know, those can be a much bigger threat to your well-being. And that, that's a, quite an eye-opener for us and something that we're still trying to sort through on that particular project, but it, hardly an isolated case that, you know, the questions of, of overall well-being, what's happening with the education system, what's happening with economics, what's happening with, uh, you know, the cultural okay. identity, what, et cetera, et cetera. Those are very pressing matters for a lot of people too. Thanks, Henry. Appreciate you chiming in on that. Yeah, thanks for the question. Hope you had fun out there too yesterday too. I did. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> now you're making us all jealous. <laughs> it was a ski so, race in Anchorage. Okay, yes, definitely jealous now. <laughs> um, so, Henry, thank you again so much. I think we're going to move on to um, Johnny's talk, but then we'll have some time at the end to kind of discuss some cross comparisons, maybe between both of your projects and regions. So we'll move over to another part of the Arctic um, to Dr. Jonathan Ryan, um, who is currently a postdoctoral research associate in environment and society at Brown University after recently completing his PhD at Aberystwyth University in Wales. Dr. Ryan is a glaciologist who uses satellite and remote sensing to understand processes of glacier mass loss and has a very interesting Navigating the New Arctic Award um, that I have a feeling you're going to hear more about in a couple of minutes. So, Johnny, I'll hand it off to you, and thanks for being here. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Okay, presenter mode. I might have to hit this. Oh, it's doing that again. Okay, I'm just gonna put it into right, okay. Can you skip? Can you see my screen? Yep. Well, thank you for um, for being here. Um, it's an honor to go after Henry Huntington, who certainly inspired some of um, this research. I haven't got the quote written down exactly, but um, in one of his papers, I think he wrote something along the lines of social scientists have done much to bring. Uh, local indigenous knowledge to wider attention 
uh, but we need experts to, in other fields to uh, join the conversation. Uh, and certainly uh, some of our work has um, been inspired by that. Uh, and this project is, is, is a, a, a navigating the new Arctic project titled uh, Co-Production of Shorefast Ice Knowledge in Umanat Bay. And um, yeah, I'm happy to present some of the, some of the findings of our, of our first field season that happened last year and some of the ongoing work that, that we're doing uh, right now. So I thought I'd start with a bit of an, a background about Umanak Bay. Um, a lot of work on shorefast ice and environmental change obviously takes place in Alaska. Uh, but Umanak Bay uh, is very similar to some of these Arctic communities, um, but obviously it's, it's, in, it's in West Greenland. Uh, Umnak is uh, basically is a town in Greenland with about a population of about a thousand people. Uh, there are eight other settlements in Umnak Bay um, with, with lesser populations. And uh, it's, they have shore fast ice for many months of the year. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and yeah, and, 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 and the community has undergone a lot of uh, change from in, in, in the past sort of decades from a fully subsistence economy based, uh, based on fishing, sealing, whaling to in a now more mixed wage based economy. Uh, people in these towns are, uh, have TVs, they have internet, but Shorefast Dice really remains a, a tremendous socio, socio cultural value to many residents. And Umanak Bay. Uh, like it represents some of the changes that have gone on in the Arctic, including you know population declines, there's high suicide rates, there's a lot of alco alcoholism. Um, but superimposed on all some of these difficulties and the and these and, the, and this transition to a, a, a mixed wage-based economy is is substantial environmental change. Um, studies have documented uh, ocean warming, uh, increases in the air temperatures. And these are having effects on, on, on the glaciers uh, that are within the fjord, uh, but they're also having tremendous effects on, on the shorefast ice, which uh, communities are reporting is, is breaking up earlier and is thinner than it has ever been. And so the goal of this project is to understand how these, you know, what are the impacts of this environmental change? Uh, what do they look like? Um, how are they happening? And how do these really matter to individuals and institutions in Ubernak? And this really chimes into the fact with Henry, what Henry was saying, where you know, climate change is just one of these, is, is one of these big changes that these communities are facing. Um, but it's not the only one. And so what we're doing in Ubernak, we, we, we went to Ubernak back in 2019, uh, in April and May. And our approach is to use, um, it, it's a very gentle approach because you know, we, we really didn't want to go in uh, like a bull in a china shop. We wanted to get to know people uh, before, we, before we sort of ask, ask them some more direct questions about, about short fast ice and environmental change. And our approach, uh, this is an example of um, some of the things we, we've been doing. So here we were invited to a, a barbecue on the sea ice and in the foreground, you see some satellite images. And we found that uh, using maps, uh, a very high resolution satellite images is, is a really great way of getting people to talk and um, start to communicate about, you know, some of their experiences, uh, you know, using the maps as a background where they can point at things uh, to, you know, to, 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 to suggest, you know, where, where they're hunting, uh, travel routes between communities and whatnot. And, this was a this this is this event was really 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 useful for um, sort of getting to know some of the community members, but also for them to get to know us. You know, we, we're obviously people that come in um, from the outside, and we, we use very different methods to understand this, this, these environmental systems. But uh, it was a great chance for them to sort of understand a little bit about what we wanted. Um, you know, um, in, in these kind of conversations. Another big part of our project is uh, sort of the STEM education part of this project. Uh, and, for, and to do this, we are really trying to get some sort of community community based monitoring off the ground. And so here we are um, with some of the uh, children at the local orphanage who we've been working with. And we've been uh, both flying 
uh, we've been flying uh, drones and we've also been using ice drills to uh, measure the thickness of shorefast ice. These are measurements that are really quite diff difficult to get from satellite data. Uh, the kids absolutely love the drilling, um, which is perhaps no surprise, anything that looks like a gun, um, they're very interested. And also, you know, we found the drilling was a very interesting way to actually measure the sea ice and, you know, see that it's only, what, you know, 30 centimetres thick. Because, you know, many people in the community are not actually taking these measurements. Um, they kind of, they stomp their foot in it, they might put their, um, their, uh, their pole to see how thick it is, but really, you know, it's, it's a very subjective thing about how thick this shorefast ice is. And the drilling, everyone was very interested to know about the results that we were, that we were getting from our, from our little drilling projects. And speaking to some of the communities, some of the members of the community, um, we, we're learning a lot. Uh, and, and, and here, some of the you know, most interesting things we're finding is you know, shorefast ice is now thinner and breaking up earlier than in ever. And I guess in ever, I mean here, is, is a 70 year, uh, year lifetime. So this is a hunter that we met who travels out on his dog sled every uh, re regularly during, during the shorefast ice season. And he's, you know, he, he said, never in my lifetime has, has, has shorefast ice been as thin and been breaking up earlier. And, and this really hits home uh, as scientists when we're trying to understand the effects of climate change. Like clearly, uh, we don't need an instrumental record. We, these, these people's stories can tell us a lot about how uh, things have changed. And there's a lot of uncertainty about the future. Um, so speaking to some of the younger people, um, they're raising concerns about, you know, whether or not they should sort of commit to learning some of these traditional activities uh, on the sea ice. Um, and since they're all, you know, since that they can see uh, the effects of, of climate change happening, you know, Hunters are telling them that the shorefast ice is weaker and, and thinner. Uh, you know, they're reading on the news that climate change is going to take a, you know, it's, it's going it's to completely wipe out Arctic sea ice. And so there's a lot of uncertainty and, um, you know, misconceptions about, you know, how the effects of, of climate change will, will, will impact uh, communities when they're making decisions about, about, about where they want their lives to go in the future. Um, Final thing that we learned was very interesting. So the fishing is fantastic in Umanac. Uh, people are making a lot of money fishing and the, the halibut in particular seem to be uh, uh, very, very plentiful. Um, but on our way out, we, we, we saw the uh, HTMS Lounge Cock in harbour in Aludasat just south. And we actually found in a satellite image a couple of days later that the, that the ship was used to make tracks in the shorefast ice. Um, it was needed to do this so that they could actually export the fish that they had in their freezers in Umanak uh, to Denmark. And they couldn't export the fish, they couldn't bring a, cru a cruiser ship in uh, until the shorefast ice was broken up. And so here you can actually see the ship's tracks in the shorefast ice, which really raised a different kind of um, perspective on, 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 you know, on, on the system. You know, it's not purely environmental, there are human uh, impacts uh, on, on the ice. And lo and behold, a couple of days later, uh, in this satellite image, we found the shorefast ice broke up, uh, clearly due to the, the ship. And, uh, and a few days after that, the, 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 uh, the, the fish in the freezers was able to be exported uh, from Umanak to Greenland. Um, so one of the things we're doing with the community is we, we're building a, a model to look at how transport has uh, over, over sea ice uh, has, has, has changed. And so for this, it, we, it's a least cost transportation model. Uh, we're basically modeling how you, can, uh, how you can move from community to community based on the surface type that we're detecting in our satellite images. Uh, here is uh, what some, some, some example routes between some of the communities. And what we can do now is we can start to quantify how uh, a longer uh, uh, open water season is affecting travel between between communities and also the speed at which they travel. Obviously, you can travel over snow much quicker than ice. And so this is the kind of thing we're developing uh, in, in, in collaboration with the communities to understand how access to different communities and, and, and to hunting grounds may be affected by, by, by shorefast ice change. And I'm going a bit over, but you know, what I would like to say here is that our field work really has inspired some new investigations of shorefast ice response to climate change. We're now looking in uh, detail about how breakup is happening 
uh, not just in Umanak, but in, but in, but in fields around uh, the Arctic. And we're not only looking at breaker, we're starting to investigate the ice edge position, which is also very critical for uh, some of the hunting activities that take place. Uh, and clearly in Umanak Bay, the ice edge position from 2000 to 2018 has varied quite considerably. And I'm just going to skip this because I'm a little bit over time, but we are now starting to project how short fast ice will change in the future by these uh, semi empirical projections. And when we apply our analysis to the whole Arctic, these are some of the findings we're, we're, that, we're, that, we're, that, we're, um, that we're quantifying. Uh, and so the red dots here are where short fast ice is expected to basically reduce by 30 to 44 days. Uh, Umanak sits in about the middle here. We're, we're expecting the, the reduction of, of short fast ice season by 15 to 18 days. But the, the effects do vary around the Arctic. And like I said, we are, we're starting to map some short fast ice edges. Um, and so I'm just going to conclude with, with how we're sort of um, hitting some of the performance elements uh, in the Coastal Resilience Collaboration Team. But uh, with the, um, thinking about in the interest of time, I think I'll just stop there and I'm happy to take any questions. So thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Johnny. That was really great to hear what your team has been up to. And I know I have a lot of questions and Julie Brigham Gretty actually asked one of the questions that I had written down for myself too. So I'll just say it. And, um, and I have a feeling a lot of other people are curious about this too. So um, was it, was it a community decision to break up the ice early or was that driven by a few powerful individuals? Uh, why did they ask for the ship to break up the ice? Um, and my question was, did the community have any say or was there a reaction to that? That's a really great question. Um, it was a surprise when we were, it was a real shame because we were flying out on the same day that we saw the ship come in. And so it was a real shame because it was like, ah, oh, we, we could have just been there a few more days and we'd have known about this. But from what I understand, none of the community members that we spoke to really knew that this was happening. So I, we think it was made by a few powerful individuals at the, in the fishing company. And clearly they had um, communicated with the, with the Danish um, naval office to bring the ship in and uh yeah people were like oh look a ship you know it was that kind of thing it wasn't like uh i don't, I don't think it was a a, a, a um a conversation uh with, with, with many in the community thank you yeah that sounds really complicated and something that probably needs to be investigated more um any other questions from the group at all So I had a question for you too, was that, um, have you observed any initial changes on kind of the, the hunters and the, the fishers on, on what they're doing maybe to mitigate risk? You said some of the children are not sure if they should be learning traditional activities, but is there anything else going on in the community on, on mitigating that risk of the shore fast ice breaking up unpredictably, whether it's boat created or climate driven? Yeah. So. From what I understand, there are there are some sort of uh, some policies and some decisions made, and 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 so from what we, what we understand, the when the shore fast ice is thick, uh, community members are allowed to travel by literally by car, by skidoo, or by dog sled, and there is a period in time when the, the mayor of the town will go out, and he will actually measure the thickness of the shore fast ice in the harbour, and then he will start to make. Uh, decisions based on what you can do and if this if the ice gets to a certain thickness he'll say you know you're no longer allowed to use cars on the on, on the shore fast ice and then from what we're learning from the hunters uh, is that you know there's the skidoos can go on a thickness of 20 centimeters about 20 centimeters and then the uh, the dog sleds could go on thicknesses as, as low as 12 centimeters so it really depends, I guess, on, on the risks that we are willing to take and the mode of transport that, that, that the um, that people are choosing to travel on. Um, but like I said, you know, these communities are very resilient and, you know, they, there are plenty of cracks that we were finding in the, sh in, in the ice and they would just, you know, they would put a, a big piece of metal over the top of it and then, and then they would use that metal to cross. And so, and likewise, you know, you'd be surprised at some of the, the sizes of the crack that they were willing to skidoo, skidoo over you know, they would just kind of get the skidoo right up to a very high speed and just go straight over it. So, you know, they, they, they are, you know, very resilient in that sense. 
um, and clearly more experienced hunters and fishermen that really are traveling great distances, even on shore fast ice that we may view as um, marginal. So you said that the mayor would go out and actually measure and then tell kind of what people do. Henry, what, how does that work on the North Slope? Um, what, do people just make their own individual decisions or is it more, um, are there kind of more higher levels of direction coming on the North Slope? Uh, no, I think it's an individual call. <laughs> I was sort of laughing at the idea that anybody would actually yeah. listen to the mayor telling them not to go out on the sea ice. Um, they do have a few things like the, uh, uh, the, the winter road, the snow road that goes to Utkiagvik from Prudhoe Bay that people can drive along and that, you know, that gets plotted out and, and, and created and so on. I think it used to go closer to the coast and has now gone, gone a little further inland and that obviously has a few extra rules and restrictions, but um, I think the, the North Slope case is, uh, this, this is to me the very interesting cases of assimilation and acculturation. It seems to me the Greenlanders are, you know, closer to the Danish mode of, you know, social well-being and behaving yourself and the Alaskans are just like Americans and ignore any authority if, whenever they can. <laughs> yeah, I just actually want to point out, so I, my, my, uh, my, uh, one of my colleagues here, a PhD student at Brown, just 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 reminded me actually that she said no one listens to the mayor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Like, well, actually, yeah, you're right. It's true. That makes um, a lot more sense. <laughs> <laughs> That's really fascinating. <laughs> um, at least he tries. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe like prevents himself from getting sued at some point, right? <laughs> Um, so we have a question from Olivia Lee. Um, I, I think this one is for Johnny. Do community members routinely use satellite images? And if so, do they know what type of satellite images that they use? That's a great question, yeah. So from, from, from our um, re field research, we, we, we find that actually um, both the youth and, and the older people in the community and the hunters are really quite taken aback by the satellite images, suggesting that they haven't really used this sort of imagery before. Uh, maybe at most they've gone onto Google Maps, but you know, when we showed them these really high resolution images of the fjord, uh, they, they're, 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 they're so excited to see them, to point out, you know, oh, that's where I you know, go hunting, that's where, you know, that's where so-and-so lives. And they're really, yeah, so, so from, what, from, what, from what we're seeing is no, I don't think they're routinely using satellite images. And um, yeah, yeah, that's something that we want to kind of facilitate in, in our research. Thank you. And I know Olivia, I don't know if you want to speak up at all, but I know some of her projects are doing a lot of that work on the North Slope. Um, I don't want to put you on the spot, Olivia, but if you want to speak up, go ahead. <laughs> well, yeah, the follow up question then to Johnny is the problem, is there a problem with access, like broadband internet access that might be an issue with actually getting some of these satellite images? For sure, yeah. So, so, so they have a, a uh, their internet cable actually comes from Canada and it comes from, it comes, it goes under, under the sea in, in Baffin Bay. Uh, and that cable actually, when, when we were there, that cable was broken. And so the internet was basically extremely poor and limited to basically mobile data which was very, very slow. So basically the entire time we were there, no one was using the internet really at all. Uh, wow. And hopefully when we go back this year, the, that, that cable will be fixed and the internet may be a little bit more accessible. Uh, but for, yeah, when we were there, a bit, a bit, people get on with their lives, you know, the internet, it doesn't really bother them. Right. It, bothered, it bothered us, um, right. trying to research things like last minute, but um, yeah, life goes on. Is it expensive, Johnny? Do you know? Extreme expensive. Yeah, the mobile okay. data was was something like forty dollars for a gigabyte. Forty dollars for a gigabyte. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And then Julie Brigham Gretty also um, highlighted a project on Baffin Island. The science community helped develop GPR smart sleds that the high school students used to map the ice thickness. It was a very cool idea. That is a very cool idea. <laughs> yeah, let me, I saw this at one of the meetings up in Fairbanks and they um, had taught the high school kids how to use the smart comma text, they called them. And they would map the traditional hunting areas and then put the data out uh, to the community and for the, um, uh, for the elders to use. And the elders were not really 
happy with this, but the kids were doing it anyway. So they learned some science and then they were helping to um, map when the ice got thin or when a ship went by and broke up the ice um, and created a, um, a lead that would put people that were further out at risk. So it was fascinating. And these are scientists from uh, Memorial University who had gone up to develop this project. So maybe, maybe I can get in contact with them and have them uh, give a talk sometime. That would be great. I would love to hear more about that for sure. Julie, is that Trevor Bell and colleagues with Smart Ice? Yes, that's Trevor mm -hmm. Bell. You got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's really interesting work. Yeah, they've even been, I don't know how much success they'd had. They were working with some of the mining companies that are bringing the ore carriers in and I think trying to see if they could find a way to get somebody to pay them for what are pretty valuable data if you have a ore carrier sitting offshore at however many tens of thousands of dollars a day doing nothing. Yeah, so maybe maybe we could get Trevor uh, involved with this webinar sometime. Yeah, I think that sounds like a great idea. Julie, I'll follow up with you um, and see if we can learn more about that. Sure. I know I've been talking a lot, so I wanna open it up for any other questions the group may have. So I did have one more question and we have a couple minutes left, but it's a big question. It's not a complicated one, but I kind of wanted to ask both Henry and Johnny, you're, you're both the kind of approaching this issue from different disciplinary perspectives. And um, I think you're at kind of different stages with different projects and things like that. And one of the big questions we get with the Navigating the New Arctic program is um, how researchers can better set up collaborations with um, Arctic residents if they want to do something like co-production or, or, or citizen science, some of the, the um, research that Julie just highlighted. And I'm wondering if you can give any advice um, from your perspectives and from your research on, on how scientists can go about doing that. The $64,000 question, right? Yes, I know. I only left five minutes for it, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, Where can okay they begin? Johnny. <laughs> it's okay with Johnny. I'll, I'll take a stab at that. I think um, it's actually, a, I think, I don't think there's a simple answer. And I think this is something we're still, we as a science community and us individually are still wrestling with. Um, I mean, partly what constitutes co-production and second, how do we get there? And I, I was talking with a colleague yesterday actually about, uh, uh, Amy will be happy to know, on the bus ride back to service high after the finish of the ski race. Um, but about the uh, you know, the fact that if we were aiming for co-production in every project we did in the Arctic, we would overwhelm the Arctic in a heartbeat. So we can't, we can't get there. There's just, there are too many projects going on, too much that needs to be done. Um, and I think it's a, you know, to me, it's a question of, of building up those relationships over time and, and giving things a chance. And a lot of it is going to happen indirectly. You know, it'd be very hard for me to go into a community where I've never worked and say, I'm here and I'm ready to co-produce with you. Let's go. Um, you know, they don't know me. They don't know what they, whether they can trust me. They don't know what I do. I don't know anything about them, et cetera. And so I think it's a, it's a question of, of that iteration. And as you heard in Johnny's talk too, going back, being there, being there repeatedly, building up the relationships, listening, learning different things on both sides, and then seeing what works and being willing to, to be flexible and adjust when somebody says, hey, you know, we're actually not that interested in the thing you're studying, but if you were studying something related to that, that we'd be pretty interested in that. Um, you know, being responsive in that way, I think is a, is a huge help so that it becomes a collaborative enterprise and a shared enterprise. And you get to the point of, of people saying, Hey, this is, this is our thing, not just your thing that you're doing from, you know, for some, from somewhere else for reasons we can't fathom. Thanks, Henry. I really like the way you put it that we, we couldn't really, we can't produce, co-produce everything. Um, the, just the capacity on all levels is, isn't there. Um, and so just being aware of the different ways that scientists can interact with communities, whether it's renting snowmobiles or buying gear and could be just as important as kind of full-on co-production as well. Yeah, I, I guess I second that. I agree with Henry. It's, yeah, it's definitely challenging. And I think it has to happen over a, you know, a long period of time, you know, making our 
grant money go as far as it can in terms of re repeat visits and spending time up there, getting to know people, and also just you know expecting that these you know these 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 relationships take time to build. Um, one of the things we found is that Facebook actually is a fantastic way of sort of staying in touch with people, and uh, that's one way in which we can sort of see pictures that have been posted by the community, comment on them. Uh, that, that's that's you know that's one way in which we kind of trying to trying to maintain these 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 good relationships with, with, with the people in the community. That's Wonderful. such a great point about making those connections. You know, it's easy to sort of be stuck on what's happening with our project, but you know, in that case, we're just we wind up being little two-dimensional cardboard yeah. cutouts of, you know, insert scientist here, whereas the connections you're talking about, Johnny, and so on, are really, I mean, make it three-dimensional on both sides, which is a huge plus. Yeah, that's a really good point. So, last call for any questions for either of our two speakers. Okay, well, Johnny and Henry, thank you so much for coming and speaking to the Coastal Resilience team. I really learned a lot from both of your talks and from the discussion. I really appreciate you both taking the time to, to come and talk to us today. Pleasure. Thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. Thanks very much. Cheers. Great. Have a good rest of your day, everybody. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you.